Credit to La Lumbra is really almost the standard guitar piece. I mean, it's, it's a great piece of music. It's, it's lovely. It, it is only what it is. It doesn't pretend to be anything more or less than a beautiful evocation of the Alhambra, memories of the Alhambra, the old Moorish palace in, in Granada. written in the style of what we call a tremolo study, which is you keep the top strings going. It's actually a bit of a trick. It sounds as if you're doing like a mandolin. In fact, you're playing one bass note and one accompanying bass note and three melodic notes. So there's a gap, but when you do it really fast, it sounds continuous. So it sounds... actually coined that phrase in print some years ago about John being the prince of the guitar. But of course I was wrong, I mean he's the king. Oh, describe him, well I could describe Describe what I like about him, and that is, um, well, he likes uh, staying up late and, and getting up in the morning late. Um, he's relaxed, he enjoys relaxing. He cherishes a, a small group of friends. Um, he likes wearing old clothes. Um, he has a rather insane sort of democratic view of things. I'm more Australian than English, but I'm more Londoner than either. But the Australian than English is very important because I do see the English from outside. I, I've been here since I was 10, so I, I love it here. But I love the ability of Australians to see through that English bullshit. Because England has become a very, certainly a multiracial society. I don't know if I would call it a multicultural society yet. Um, but as an Australian, I've developed these thoughts and feelings um, rather like a foreigner in England. And I don't actually see the, the English liberalism, the English sense of tolerance and fair play, and the English sense of welcoming um, foreigners, as it were, or other cultures. I don't see it as being uh, done very well. I was born in 41, 1941 in Melbourne. My father had been a, what well, nowadays we call a session guitarist. He was like a dance band, uh, radio show band guitarist uh, during the late 30s and a guitar teacher. And then he met my mother. In fact, met my mother through a mutual love, intellectual flirtation with 
generally left-wing causes, but also jazz, because she used to go to jazz clubs as a young girl. And my father being a jazz guitarist, and the, he's sort of continuing the Reinhardt tradition in Australia at that time, or, or, or sort of joining it. And I took up guitar. Well, I used to think I started at the age of seven. I think it was just something that stuck in my memory. But in fact, he, he pointed out much later in life to me and showed me photographs that I actually started at the age of four. And he, he himself had been turning more and more to classical playing. But throughout all this and during my childhood, he was a, also a great animal lover, always was. In fact, the last year before we came to London from Australia, he worked at Melbourne Zoo for a year looking after the hippopotamus. But he'd always loved animals. We had dogs and I had a lizard and a cockatoo and a, and a, a ferret, I think. Turn on, boys. But later in life, he uh, developed a very in intense interest in a South American monkey from the Amazon forest. In fact, it was a threatened species and uh, ended up uh, founding a wonderfully successful monkey sanctuary. No, it was just up on the sloping tree over there. Hey. See the sloping one? Up, 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 up there. that one there. Yeah. Oh, there it is. That's it. Mm. You can't, I don't even see the baby now. From the other side, you can see the baby. And the other day, you could see it, cle you could see it clearly because she was um, looking down the other side. Right. Well, that's, mm. that's a first for me after 12 years. I've never, first, se I've never seen, seen, I've never seen any Australian wildlife here except for the <laughs> birds. Oh, we'll have to go and see if we can find a kangaroo. When I first looked at this place, it was a sort of joke. I thought it'd be nice to have a little somewhere to build some sort of natural mud brick type, something a bit organic in Australian house. Even like now, even though I don't come out for long patches, uh, it's still great to have for a few days. I might come out before the beginning of a tour or before a few concerts and uh, get off the plane and come straight down here like one o'clock in the morning off the 24 hour journey from London. Get up in the morning and there's this. It's, a, it's, it's my Australian roots. I can settle in, practice for a couple of hours a day, get rid of the jet lag. My father was a very forceful character, and in relation to me and the guitar, he was very persuasive. So, like, I never actually had to practice. But he had a way of making one feel that you ought to. But I used to do half an hour's practice a day only. I never thought of myself as what I was going to do. It was always assumed I'd be a guitarist, and I just knew I could move my fingers well, you know. I just knew I had an, an aptitude for it, that my father had taught me well. And it's just been that I've, I've been lucky, really lucky, that I've been amazingly well taught. One very important part uh, of my father and mother's life that was also continuously to be a part of mine was meeting a, a large community of um, people. And it was a sort of alternative little miniature society creating a lifestyle uh, based around works of art, jewelry, painting, sculpture, music. Mont Selvat is the name of the place.
What is extraordinary is that it's very extraordinary in Western music, actually. Um, John becomes a part of the instrument and the instrument a part of him. After his last solo recital in Australia, uh, a very, very distinguished guitarist said to me, you know, he said that was just extraordinary. He said that there is not one guitarist in the whole world who could do what John did last night. And that is true. The solo trips I was doing on my own got to be a bit of a bore, to put it mildly. Finally, round about 72, 73, I actually decided not to do any foreign, regular foreign touring at all. No point in having too much to live on, but not having a life to lead. I'm going to see Greg Smallman, great Australian guitar maker. And it's very strange, after 12 years, I've kept on planning to come up and see him, and I've never been yet, so I've seen photographs of the place. And this is quite a rough road in bits, and I've been told about that. He's got this wonderful guitar, which I saw back in April, but we met in Sydney, and uh, he just wanted to hang on to it for a bit to check a few things, so that's, of course, the main reason I'm coming up now, but equally exciting is actually seeing this part of the country, which I've also never been to, quite apart from seeing Greg. Is this one of the ones I tried in April in yes. Sydney? Yes. Is it the one I preferred then? I shouldn't ask you that. <laughs> we always get it wrong. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. Well, I thought so. I could say. But... It's absolutely beautiful. I mean, without trying my old one, it, it seems to have that same clear magic y thing I always used to say. Just for now, before I'll have a proper look, I'll, I'll show you with mine, which has settled down a bit. I mean, this is, what, three, four years old. But the overall... See, this has always had that lovely silky thing. There's so many lovely high harmonics shimmering in there, a little bit Australian because I identify it with the shimmer of like gum tree leaves, you know. And it always comes out in little chords like guitar has been due for a long time for a, a re-evaluation of the way it's made. It's not like a violin or a cello which was made and designed hundreds of years ago and is perfect. It just does what it's supposed to do. Even if it's not a Stradivarius, it still sounds and works properly. The guitar doesn't as a musical instrument. God. There they all are. So which is the latest thing you're doing with the edge that you were saying, you know, the one... Oh, what, and is that an un, sort of unfinished grid? Raw, raw lattice. <laughs> raw <yeah>. lattice. <laughs> I'm very inquisitive as to how things really work. Can you move that like the top works or does yes, it have exactly to be on the, the top? Yes, exactly the same. Yeah. I break it, so you do it. And I started to get very interested in the way the top of a guitar works because that's crucial to the playing. It's almost like touching your own skin or someone else's skin. Right. Um, this way we're getting no movement there. Right. And lots there, there and there. Right. Um, that's a traditional soundboard. Right. It uses a system of strutting called fan struts. The thickness of the top and the size of the struts is the most important thing. 
But you'd still rather have the old light wood that you were trying oh, to get? Oh, yes, or? yes. Like this particular sort of soundboard that I make, right. um, the middle is much stiffer. Right. The edges are much more flexible. Right. And the whole thing is much, much lighter. Yeah. I get a lot more sustain from this soundboard. Do you know, I've never seen that either. That's incredible. I had no idea it was like that. I've been playing. <laughs> that is... The great, interesting, wonderful thing about Greg Smallman and his approach, he starts off from admiring the traditional, not knocking it, but admiring it, wanting to know, is it possible to improve it in some way? And that he quite clearly has for me. And he's basically made the guitar a more musical instrument. I'm very good on my own. I don't like traveling to see places, but I, I like, or well, certainly did like, the traveling I did on tour, you know. And, but I'm, I'm a sociable person. I always enjoy playing with other people, and I always like to have that on my mind. But the latest I, I, idea I had was to somehow combine the, not only my friendships and musical connections, if you like, but the elements of Australian music making, which is a, a very growing uh, thing of its own, it has a very strong identity in the way that it's combined Australian elements with influences, obviously, from European musical culture. And so I uh, got together this group, Attacker, at which is really a mixture of those, those things. Practically very difficult, because half of them are Australian, half of them from London, but musically it turned out to be not only very rich as an ensemble, but it gave great uh, variety. Oh, John, I wonder could your solo there come from absolutely nowhere, from nothing? Uh, Desolate, lonely... Peter Sculthorpe, right. the great Australian composer, not a member of the group, wrote a piece for us. Also, Michael, you were nearly two bars late. And no, I missed, from that, it was great. Yeah, and I yeah. missed the two chords before. Peter <laughs> Sculthorpe's music is really, uh, it's more than attractive. Really it has a kind of hold on me because of a, a quality. It's almost a, a, a geological quality. It's just a really non-musical word. Most of my music is about the landscape, about Australian landscape. somebody, I always like to know that person well. And writing for John, um, I wouldn't write um, a highly charged dramatic work because he's not, a, he's not a highly dramatic person, he's very laid back. Um, of all the wonderful things that John does in his playing, I think it's, it's the tone colour, it's the particular colours that he gets from the guitar that um, interests me most. And so therefore I try to write music not that is not virtuosic, but more music that is about 
um, creating the most beautiful possible sounds that I'm able to dream up from the guitar, especially for him. He plays with Australian-made instruments, made from Australian wood. And so in writing for him, it's almost as though the music is coming from this very Australian earth. Where does that? Uh, well, that is, uh, the name of it is Jalili, and it means whistling duck, that is whistling hyphen duck. It's right. a species of duck. Oh, wow. On a billabong. Right. And it's sort of, it's taken over my life a little bit because I keep using it in, in pieces. So, uh, you know, I will have some Aboriginal elements, but I mean, I'm more interested in finding a, lot of, a whole lot of new sounds because I want to write um, new, birds yeah. and... Um, uh, mosquitoes, of course, and didgeridoo sounds, if we can find them, um, anything. The trouble with a lot of the mm. other sounds, mm. I mean, trouble for yeah. me, yeah. is that I sometimes find it difficult to dissociate mm. myself from all that sort of avant-garde experimentalism of the 60s. Which, yes, well, yeah, which, I do, we don't want that. Which we right? don't, no. but it did yeah. throw up mm. one or two nice ones, didn't it? Right. I, mean, I remember, yeah. actually, yeah. some friends of mine used a milk bottle <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> on the strings. It was a little bit like the old bottleneck yeah, sounds. Right. Um, I don't know what we've got. Um, mm. I, could, I mean, it's a little bit like this sort of sound, like where you go with your fingers. Right. That, mm. that. Mm. But uh, it's better. Well, it? Use a teaspoon. <laughs> right. well, why not? Let's go a bit of coffee on it. So, <laughs> right. So, I mean, you get mm. something like. Uh, More like, um, can't we get some birds? You know? um, ah, it's beautiful. I think learning from the way animals live and relate to each other is uh, more than very important. It's absolutely crucial. You can get nowhere in understanding human nature, uh, human relationships, without looking at the past. And I don't mean human history as the past. I mean evolution and animals and societies and how they lived with the elements. Actually, it ties in again with my feeling about Australia because Australia is still, for, you know, it's, it's enormous size and very few people, and is still comparatively, certainly comparing to Europe, close to the elements. The elements are still a problem to live with. I always think that in a place like London, you have to be some kind of antisocial idiot not to be affected by what's going on around you.
One of the byproducts of, of, of not actually liking touring so much and just liking being in town is that uh, I always think that if you're touring, you're basically, especially as a soloist, you're playing one, maybe two programs, night after night, week after week, you're doing the same thing. But you actually be in the one place, which is London, where there's such a variety of things going on, there's such constant stimulation, and if you like chance, accidental meetings with other musicians, maybe through friendships, maybe through musical reasons to start with, that uh, things develop. That's a difficult one for me though. I get the opportunity to play in contemporary music concerts and uh, follow up some of the music with other musicians that otherwise I mightn't have the time to do. And one of the most pleasurable of these is with Sebastian Bell. Yes, I very mean, much absolutely. So. Yes. You're, yeah, that, as soon as we start play, waiting for each other, there's a dangerous thing. Because okay. okay. you want to keep your rocking sort of... Particular pieces, uh, these are by Toru Takamitsu, Japanese composer. And the uh, three pieces for alto, flute and guitar are particularly magical in a way because they're so impressionistic and expressive and not at all what many people think that modern music is going to be. This is, this is quite a beautiful piece. The beauty of the guitar note is finally is in the essence of its dying away. And you can hear it go right into silence. And if you, t you can take a tune like... sort of sequence of it's an old Japanese uh, t traditional song it's a sequence of notes which you know or your, your ear is aware they're all dying but they're all being replaced by something else so there's a, your ear is concentrated on the space between the notes as much as on the note themselves and there's a kind of magic in that Agustin Barrios and Mangore, to give him his full name, was this great Paraguayan guitarist composer and he lived from, what, 1885 to the early 1940s. And his music is just, it's everything. He wrote in Baroque style, he wrote in 19th century romantic style, and he wrote in his own sort of semi-folk style. greatest guitar composer, in other words, guitarist who wrote guitar music, of all. He had a real feeling for form. His pieces used to balance, you never felt they were too long or too short. And 
melodically, they sort of used to join up. They weren't just one little clever idea. So you, his harmonies are almost like a jazz musician. I used to think, uh, I still do, that a, a lot of his phrases are like Django Reinhardt, the great jazz gypsy guitarist, that, is that they, one tune sort of takes you, without you knowing it, into another part of the tune. Uh, an example would be... Uh, <laughs> this to continue to listen. It's a continuous imagination and it is a very notable composer. was broadly speaking Australian but she was half Chinese. My father was a Londoner. Of course London in those days was the centre of empire wasn't it you know even to sort of cultured left-wing people it was the centre of, of the cultural empire. So in 1951, 52, when we all came back to London. <laughs> the idea was my father would open a, a guitar school, uh, which he did with great success, which is, is still running. And also there's, there's an idea to hear the great Django Reinhardt, who then was still alive. He didn't die until 1953. And Segovia, an idea of uh, me studying with Segovia was what was in my father's mind. Because the whole thing about guitar playing at that period was to be like Segovia and to follow in his image. Maestro, after 50 years, over 50 years of concert giving, uh, what are your feelings about the guitar and yourself? The guitar, I think that uh, now is at its beginning. Well, Segovia was the god, if you like. I mean, the fact that he created a repertoire, he created the guitar as a concert instrument. I mean, he tried and he was proud of me and he, you know, everything. And he was very kind and he gave me all the help and, you know, I don't take any of that away or, or regret any of it. Then, and there are the many uh, young people at the head of, we, of whom you are, my dear. And uh, I think the future of the guitar is already settled. But it's just one of those slightly painful things for me, even in older age, is that I have to sort of reassess and, you know, it, honesty compels me to, to, to re-examine uh, what kind of person he was and, and uh, both in terms of the teaching, obviously, which is a very important, the most important in a way, but in terms of the personality, because I think there is a clue there uh, in the personality to a lot of other things that are musical. When Segovia was in London, I would go to the Piccadilly Hotel and play for him. And I remember I played a couple of pieces. And he said, oh, you must come to Siena in Italy, where I teach at a summer school. Uh, and I'll arrange a scholarship and you can go next year. Because I was only 11 or 12 at the time. It'd be a sort of semicircle of, of people and some would be sitting in front of him playing. Looking back, and even at the time, I can see that I was aware that I've never really played 
what I thought was my best. I mean, if I was practicing at home, I used to sort of get into great indulgent sort of fantasies about the piece. Yeah, I think there's an age in childhood and early teens when they go through quite unconsciously sort of romantic, poetic sort of feelings which they don't quite know how to express to other people or even on an instrument, but they feel them. And it's important that they come out. And if a teacher, you know, whoever the teacher is, can't see that and encourage it, then it's definitely a shortcoming of the teacher. Can I stop you? Because what, what happened down there? Is that just... I've always taught, uh, but over the years I've developed a certain lack of enthusiasm for going through the usual solo guitar repertoire with students, sometimes who may be very good, in which case they can do without being taught by me. It sounded like you're playing a different piece. Or students who are not very good, who need to be encouraged to find their own way, not simply to imitate what I do. I've found that this solo repertoire, that it's so cut off from the mainstream of musical development. Stop you otherwise. If it was difficult, and I know, but it's a simple ensemble, that. Right. I have got to feel over the years that trying to change this attitude to the guitar is more important than how good particular people might play a solo piece. Their ability to join in with others and make real music in a musical way, similar to what violinists do. And what I think is, is, is bad about the influence of, of Segovia's teaching is that because of the guitar repertoire being very poor, certainly in relation to cello and piano, is that the, the way, the musical way of playing became focused around a style of playing his style, which in a way was greater than the music. He had no way of encompassing a, a big view of the music, even when it was there, and the Bach suites were there. Even the better Scarlatti sonatas are quite well developed as pieces of music. facility is amazing but um, what I particularly like about him is that he understands he appreciates the composer's work and he has the somehow this, this ability to actually let the music speak rather than than hear his own um, input his own uh, personality and that in itself is, is a tremendous personality a humble person and that goes into his, his music making. lived the last 30 years of his life in Spain and he actually used the harmonies of especially Andalusian music uh, in which to build up his chords. Scarlatti would be basing his harmonies on, on the tuning of the guitar which is in fourths. Unlike stringed instruments which are violin, viola and cello, in fourths, like that. And so if he wanted to fatten out a chord, make it bigger, he wouldn't restrict himself to the thirds of conventional harmony, which would be like that, but he would use the open strings of the guitar, which sort of sounds like wrong notes. But if you hear it in flamenco, which has evolved from the music of Andalusia and southern Spain, you hear, often hear chords like this. Time. 
And they're a very strong element in, in Scarlett's music, and this particular A minor sonata has a lot of it in, in it. And it wasn't simply a question of odd little bits that sound a bit, you know, imitation Spanish. He actually took in lots of the, 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 the dance rhythms, uh, the actual tunes, popular tunes, which he incorporated into a, a sonata. Very often on guitar we strum, but flamenco playing, when they strum, they have a whole very highly developed system with the, with the right hand, which is not classical, but it has some things in common. Most of their rhythmical chords, not all, begin with the thumb and its nail on what we call the upstroke. The result is that you start with the highest note. gives a much crisper, more rhythmical attack. So instead of going, you have. Um, however, there are lots of uh, areas in between the two extremes where you can still get some of the character of sound. And I often go, uh, when I'm in slight doubt, I go to a very old friend of mine, which is lucky for me, uh, Paco Pena, the great, great musician, great flamenco guitarist. And he lives down the road from me and it's really good for me I mean I often do this whether it's a social evening or just 10 minutes because I've dropped by for a cup of tea and it needn't be a specific lesson as such but I just say hey you know I'm practicing this piece again is this right what I'm doing at the moment is is severe I, I, this is a piece by Albanis I've played it for 30 or 40 years and the thing that's always worried me is the difference between, let's say, the classical approach, which I'd learned from Segovia and everyone plays in that way, and the fact that it is a dance, the Sevillanus. So it's that bridge from playing that would be, if you like, a nice tuneful classical way of playing it. But it is a dance, and you I don't know, you couldn't possibly dance to this, could you? One of the practical problems, as I asked about, and this is where I've refingered it, coming back to what I was asking before, is getting back up to the chord here after you do. But it's very important to me in, in these occasions to try and get some of the feel of the authentic dance. So in a case like that, I will go to Paco and I say, what should I do? And he'll say, well, you want to keep the dance going like X, Y, Z. And so I'll start re, re-fingering the strumming. So I'll be going something like...
<laughs> C minor one. <yeah. laughs> That's what classical composers do is to change key unnecessarily. For me, for a flamenco player, yeah. rhythm is fundamental. Just do those few bars at yeah, the beginning, because right. I can really. Funnily enough, I find classical a lot of classical guitars playing Spanish music, even Spanish classical guitars, they take a lot of liberties um, with expressing with the rhythm in a way that is that is um, it's sort of artificially romantic, you know. I find, but I find John particularly good at, at that in, in at keeping the rhythm uh, alive and, and unstoppable, you know, like it rules. So I identify very much with uh, his interpretation of a lot of Spanish music. I think he's probably the best I can think of, really, in, in the classical guitar. Albanis never wrote for the guitar, but undoubtedly a lot of the pieces sound wonderful on guitar and have a, have a colour, a range of colours that they couldn't have on the piano, even though you can't get as many notes in. Uh, my favourite of all of them, and there are at least five or six which are great pieces of music on the guitar, but my favourite, personal favourite, is Cordoba. I do know the, the, the town of Cordoba and the, the mosque, the Mesquita, which is, uh, I'm sure, the inspiration for the opening quiet section of Cordoba. is such a magical place and it's still a beautiful opening. It's got the impressionist feel, it's a beautiful tune and it's real guitar music.
music expresses the inexpressible. And I think in all ways, music can just touch a point which it's very difficult to find words for. One of the benefits of meeting musicians, not just from other countries, but other musical cultures, is that you, you can find your place. And uh, part of the fortune of being a guitarist is that while there is no really solid classical repertoire to talk of, in another way, its repertoire is unlimited. Contemporary activity in music, whether it's commercial music, film music, popular music, jazz, all these influences, now what's called world music or ethnic music, etc., where the guitar is a, a, a really a, a crucial part of it. It's not just an extra thing that we have to adapt a little bit of imitation of something, you know, play it on guitar, but it actually is an integral part of what all these cultures are doing and using. So in that way, the guitar's unlimited. I mean, my frustration as, as a guitarist and hopefully a, a musician, is I wish I could participate in more. I, I can't play jazz, I wish I could. I think it's a very simple one, if anything, that I have as, as a belief, which is that it, the actual business of trying to find out and discover things is, if you like, the message. I find that musically, looking back, I've learned much more from those relationships, people I've, I've, as it were, bumped into, that I've admired. That's the way I feel musically I've learned most in life. I think learning comes from inspiration and I'm very easily inspired, you know. Uh, I hear something beautifully played or beautifully written, I think, wow, that's great. i give an example, which is a, which is a pearl. I've always liked doing the odd film session, playing for films, and in, I think it was 1969, I met Stanley Myers, playing the tune for a film, and he started playing. And I said, that is fantastic, absolutely beautiful. And he said, well, it's only that. I said, but that's, that's wonderful. I said, write a middle bit, write a middle section, and that'll be a piece of music, not just the film tune. The film is called The Walking Stick and it was set in, the, in Docklands. Uh, and then, you know, for, um, a lot of people then, I mean, it's become a really famous, I mean, a beautiful tune, whether it's a film tune or a guitar solo, which is often played. Cavatino. That piece went on to became known as the theme from The Deer Hunter. And, this is a roundabout way of saying it, so it's really lucky to be a guitarist in our time, is that you're a part of that everyday thing. And hopefully, the mere fact of it will, will throw up a cavatina or a lovely tune every now and then, which will last.